like to invite our next speaker. That's an international. He's an international luminary from India, and he is another uh, other than our editor of IGO, IGO and our favorite speaker, Dr. Santosh Unavar sir. Sir will be talking about the oncological principles for an oculoplasty surgeon. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Kunjal. Thank you for the opportunity. Are my slides seen? Uh, yes, sir. They are visible. All right. So I'll be talking about uh, oncological principles for an oculoplasty surgeon. It's important because about 50% of tumors of the ocular surface, eyelid and orbit presenting to an oculoplasty surgeon can be malignant with impending risk to life, eye and vision salvage. Let's start with ocular surface tumors. Uh, it's important to understand when not to use topical therapy in ocular surface tumors. And when we perform surgery to make sure to obtain edge and base clearance, and when we plan adjuvant treatment, it should be histopathology guided and not random, and also screen for regional lymph node metastasis and be aware of target therapy. When diagnosis is in doubt, you should never use topical therapy. This looks like ocular surface squamous neoplasia, but look at the patient's face. He has unilateral red eye. And when we flip the lid, we find that the lid margin is thickened. There is rounding of the posterior lid margin. Mebomin gland orifices are all lost. So it's pegetoid sebaceous gland carcinoma where topical therapy may not work at all. When you're not sure about the stage, again, you should not use topical therapy. Oculoplasty surgeons tend to read the abstracts and some of them treat the patient with disastrous consequences. Like this patient had oasis and was treated with topical treatment and the patient has obviously worsened. So they should read the small print that in patients who have T3 disease, it doesn't just mean that there is a superficial lesion, but there might be a lesion which involves cornea, intraocular structures, fornicial conjunctiva, et cetera. So not cross staging, but go into the details of the staging and then decide if you really want to treat that patient with topical therapy. Coming to edge and base clearance in surgery, the principle is to excise the tumor with four millimeter clinically clear margins, which means that you should have stained the tumor with rose bengal, determine the clinical margins under slit lamp by microscopy, draw a large picture or use a digital photograph intraoperatively to determine the margins intraoperatively after having given a block, sometimes the margins become indistinguishable. And for the corneal epithelial component, use alcohol-assisted keratoepitheliectomy and resection edge should be cryoed twice over. Edge is easy to determine. This is a rose bengal stained tumor. You can see that the edge is quite clear. Beyond that, you go 4 millimeter on all sides. And for the corneal epithelial component, you do alcohol-assisted keratoepitheliectomy. But for the base, you have to do either anterior segment OCT or UBM. Otherwise, this patient where corneal stroma is already involved could not have been detected at all if you had not used imaging. And so surgical excision is definitely not the treatment of choice for this patient. So patients who have scleral invasion or corneal stromal invasion need to be additionally treated not by sclerectomy or lamellar keratectomy, but by plaque brachytherapy, which can be eye and vision saving as you see here. Adjuvant therapy should not be guided by guests. There is a habit among oculoplasty surgeons and even cornea specialists to provide topical 5 chloroacyl or mitomycin following excision. It should rather be guided by histopathology. This is the protocol that is supposed to be followed for adjuvant therapy. When resection edge is positive and it has only carcinoma in situ or dysplasia, then if you're already performed cryotherapy, then you can simply observe. But if you have not performed edge cryotherapy, then topical chemotherapy or topical immunotherapy would be appropriate. If resection edge is positive and it has invasive squamous cell carcinoma, we know that invasive squamous cell carcinoma does not respond to topical therapy so well, so we have to re-excise it. If resection base is positive and the pathologist can localize the base to a particular clock hour, then you can do cryotherapy and closely observe the patient. But if the resection base is positive and it is diffuse positivity, or the clock hour cannot be discerned easily by the pathologist, then plaque brachytherapy would be logical. If margins and base are negative, but the patient is prone to recurrence, such as patient with xeroderma pigmentosum or HIV seropositivity, then immunomodulation once a day dose of interferon may help. For patients who have a large tumor, then you might want to do PET CT scan of head and neck or sentinel node biopsy, especially in patients who have conjunctival melanoma. 
We should know the role of target therapy specifically in conjunctival melanoma. Mutational spectrum has all been worked out and for each mutation, we have a specific target therapy. Literature is appearing showing use, usefulness of certain target therapeutic agents such as pembrolizumab, which was able to resolve this extra large uh, extension of a melanoma, conjunctival melanoma, anterior orbital extension. We have literature on neolumab, and this is our own patient where the patient had regional lymph node extension for which neolumab was indicated. He also had subtle ocular surface recurrence as well, which responded completely to systemic lumab, nivolumab, and the patient had complete re regression of the ocular surface recurrence as well. So this is something that may be useful. For eyelid tumors, the oncological principles are intraoperative margin control and for sebaceous gland carcinoma to exclude intraepithelial tumor by doing MAP biopsy. Multimodal treatment should be used in advanced tumors and we also have to screen these patients for regional lymph node metastasis. There's a role for target therapy as well. In sebaceous gland carcinoma, it is important to mark the edges very carefully, both on the skin side as well on, as on the conjunctival side because in sebaceous gland carcinoma, the tarsal conjunctival component may be much larger than what is visible on the skin. Intraoperative margins are sent to the pathologist while the patient waits under anesthesia or if you're doing under local anesthesia, waits for reconstruction. And once the margins are received as negative, then you proceed with reconstruction. In patients with sebaceous gland carcinoma, it is ideal to perform MAP biopsy from 17 sites lay it on a filter paper, mark each num each of the locations and send it to the pathologist so that we rule out pejetoid invasion. For patients who have a much larger tumor of this sort with anterior orbital extension, they all don't deserve orbital ex excentration. This patient has responded very well to chemo reduction. You can see the residual tumor involves only the medial two-thirds of the lower lid now. The orbital component is all gone, thus amenable to local excision. This was a patient with lacrimal sac sebaceous gland carcinoma, a very unusual variant where somebody had already done a DCR, letting the cat out of the bag. There is an intranasal extension as well, but the patient has 6'6 vision and we wanted to save the eye. And that was possible with chemo reduction, dacrocystectomy, and stereotactic radiation. We have uh, for basal cell carcinoma, especially target therapy in the form of vismodigib and sonidigib. This is for syndromic variant of basal cell carcinoma. The same treatment can now be used, used for orbital extension as well. For squamous cell carcinoma, where the patient may be inoperable because of systemic, lesion, systemic uh, uh, reasons, now can be stabilized and controlled, and the patient can be symptomatically made to feel better by using epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors such as erlotinib. In orbital tumors, complete excision of a well-circumscribed tumor is the oncological principle irrespective of the fact that clinically it may be malignant or benign. If it's well circumscribed, we would rather excise. For patients who have uh, uh, infiltrative lesion, incisional biopsy is warranted or safe debulking with intraoperative diagnosis. That should be followed by histopathology guided adjuvant treatment and there's a role for multimodal treatment as well. In incisional biopsy, the principles are direct approach and multimodal biopsy. This was a patient with adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland where a lid crease incision was used and an incisional biopsy had been performed, but unfortunately, bone was also cut by the prior surgeon. Now, the patient has recurrence all over the extent of the eyelid, nodular recurrences, and there is extension of the tumor into the temporal fossa as well. So whenever you perform incisional biopsy, specifically for lacrimal gland tumors, there has to be a direct approach without a flap so that even if there is seeding that is localized, and that area could be included in, in the field of radiation. We should also know about the way of performing incisional biopsy because about 20% of orbital biopsies result in misleadingly wrong diagnosis because of unrepresentative sample, non-uniform pathology, especially in lymphoproliferative lesions, and also tissue reaction. This was a young child with an orbital mass, most likely rhabdomyosarcoma, and we have a protocol of performing biopsy from multiple areas right to the epicenter of the lesion, and we have access to these tissues. From the superficial biopsy from zone, which is very close to the periosteum, we found only inflammation and fibrosis that was tissue reaction. In the mid zone and deep biopsy, we found the tumor, rhabdomyosarcoma, which was embryonal. So if we were to confine ourselves to only a superficial biopsy in this patient, our misdiagnosis would be orbital inflammation. 
So you should remember that uh, tumors may have uh, variable pathology in variable in uh, different parts of the lesion, especially in round cell tumors. There could be tumor necrosis and tissue reaction in the periphery of the tumor. And lymphoproliferative lesions have a tendency to have benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia, atypical lymphoid hyperplasia, and lymphoma in the same lesion in different parts. So multi-level biopsy is warranted right up to the epicenter of the lesion. There is a role for intraoperative diagnosis as well. Patients who have extensive lesions like this, it's ideal to perform a biopsy from a safe location, do an intraoperative diagnosis, and proceed with debulking or uh, near total excision only if it is not amenable to systemic therapy or for the local therapy. This was a patient with eosinophilic granuloma and all we needed to inject was triamcinolone with consequent complete bone remodeling, one more similar patient. Histopathology guided adjuvant therapy is indicated especially in solitary fibrous tumors. This was a patient where there was no cellular atypia, no adjuvant treatment was given. However, this patient also had SFT but had cellular atypia and mitotic activity for which uh, adjuvant radiotherapy was warranted. In orbital lymphoma, not all patients need to be treated with external beam radiation. This patient had an anteriorly located lymphoma and was a professional and had wanted minimal morbidity. So this patient could be safely treated with rituximab with minimal side effects and no ocular complications. Oculoplasty surgeons also tend to perform orbital excentration more often than not, but we should understand that orbital excentration, just that without any adjuvant therapy, may have a high risk of mortality. So it's important that we consider adjuvant chemotherapy, especially in patients who have a possibility of micrometastasis, which can come up several years later. So adjuvant chemotherapy, biologicals or target therapy for patients with stratification of risk is warranted. In multimodal treatment, we perform biopsy to confirm, confirm the uh, diagnosis, then chemo reduce the tumor, then do a uh, N-block excision and deliver stereotactic radiation. And that works very well for adenoid cystic carcinoma with much improved outcome. So in conclusion, I would say that adherence to oncological principles optimizes life, eye, and vision salvage in patients with tumors of the ocular surface, eyelid, and orbit. Thank you so much. <laughs>